interest uh, uh, in talk talks. My name is Shilva Subramanian, so I am out of breath. Uh, I'm the Director of Curriculum and Education Initiatives here at the Office of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies uh, in the Medical School. Uh, and I see a lot of new faces today, which is great. Um, so for those of you who don't know what we do here, uh, every week, Thursday or Friday mornings, we have a career professional development event that happens. And this is part of the faculty corner series, which acting on your feedback, uh, those of you who attended in the past, Chalk Talk seemed like what I call a hidden curriculum. Everybody knows about it, but nobody knows what it involves, how to prepare for a Chalk Talk, how to deliver a good Chalk Talk, and how you would be evaluated. So this is a two-part series on Chalk Talks. Um, the first one, uh, Dr. Evan Smithin from Microbiology is here with us, uh, and he'll give a quick presentation on Chalk Talks, and then Akila Ahmed, who is a postdoc in urology, will be the moderator and ask him some follow-up questions based on what you submitted. Uh, following this in November, we have Dr. Kristen Burley uh, and Mary O'Rarden, uh, who are going to uh, give insights from a senior faculty member as to what do search committees look for in a chalk talk and how are they evaluated. Uh, Dr. Burley and O'Rarden have sat on many, many search committees, so they know uh, what uh, is being evaluated by uh, your update by chalk talk. So thank you for attending. And uh, it's Evan and Akila. Um, so we're going to get started with a five to 10 minute um, slide presentation. Um, probably going to go over the basics. Um, after that, we're going to basically leave it to you guys to ask the questions. Um, I also have a list of questions that you have submitted. Um, and so if you guys are feeling a little shy, I'll start it off. Um, but yeah, so please raise your hands and uh, welcome. So yeah, I take it from the attendance that um, this is mysterious and anxiety provoking as it was for me, because uh, it's just not something that you're taught. You, we've been trained on the good PowerPoint generation, and every important presentation that you've probably given to this point um, has been a PowerPoint. So then to go in what some ways feels like the most important presentation of your life in a totally different medium is like terrifying, right? So I think this is great that you're all here, and, and I hope that I could impart some, some wisdom and kind of take some of the mystery out of it and, and give you some comfort and give you some tips in terms of preparing. And, and really, it's not as terrifying as it, as it seems. Um, it just takes practice like anything else and kind of coming up with a plan. So hopefully if we do that. So I wanted to start just by kind of putting the talk, talk in context of the larger interview process that you'll be going through. So I went on um, eight interviews when I was searching for a faculty position. And you know, plus or minus, they were all pretty much the same in terms of what they, they entailed. Um, so the kind of main keystone thing, keystone um, aspect is your, your seminar of your work, or your doctoral work, and you know, it should be very polished, you should be very comfortable with this, you might talk about this many, many times, um, and it's just you know, a standard departmental seminar, no, no mystery. And maybe one added thing to that is it's common, and I did this, is to add five minutes at the end, kind of as a preview to your talk talk, to say in really big picture terms what you're interested in doing when you start your lab. Um, not everyone will be able to go to your talk talk, and not everyone will uh, go to your talk talk or your seminar, or vice versa. So you want to kind of give people you know, the whole picture, even if they can't make a call of your presentation. Uh, second kind of major aspect of interview is lots and lots and lots of faculty meetings. It becomes pretty overwhelming and exhausting. So I think typically the interviews are two days, and you'll have 15 to 20 one-on-one -on -one meetings, which is a lot easier than our half hour. And I think. What's typical for um, people going to interviews to put a lot of emphasis into preparing for their talk talk and their seminar and not necessarily preparing for those meetings, but I think that's a, a big mistake. Um, one, these are your potential future colleagues, so I think it's, it's worth doing the due diligence to figure out what they're interested in and what sort of work are they doing and are there opportunities for collaboration. Um, and also, obviously, that will create um, more comfortable and productive interactions with all the faculty. And, um, I personally, you know, other than the other side of things, appreciate when someone knows who I am when they come to meet with me, um, and it's just it's more pleasing. Um, so I think there's a lot of reasons to do that. Third, there's quote unquote social interactions, which include breakfast and dinners. 
And I put social in quotes because it's important to remember this is part of the interview. So you don't want to like go to the dinner and start like pounding beers or you know, like, bitching about your postdoctoral doctoral mentor and, and, and things like that. Like you should always be on and kind of maintain professionalism throughout. Um, so if you again thinking over the other side, if you're going to sit there with a candidate and they're you know talking smack about everyone they can think of. You know, that's the sort of person that's probably going to talk about you and your institution behind your back and not actually the type of person you want with colleagues. So always be on. Um, similarly, when you're meeting with trainees, it's not a break. You should be on. Um, treat them with respect, as you would like to be treated, obviously. Um, but also, there's a lot to gain out of that. So meeting from the perspective of an interviewing faculty candidate. Um, one can gain insight into the, the training environment of the institution in a way that isn't always as easy to extract from faculty. And, and in the end, you know, the trainings of an institution are, are will make or break you, right? Those are the people that you know, are taking what you have as these beautiful ideas and actually implementing them um, and, and doing the hard work uh, as you're doing and, and I've done in the past. Um, so it, it, it's really important to be prepared for that as much as you prepare for um, all of these, these parts of the interview process. And lastly, of course, the, the, the mysterious chalk talk. So what is it? Um, I would say that it's important, you know, you have a host for your interview, so you should ask the host what they expect. Um, and they might you know, say slightly different things, but in general, I think they all want the same thing, which is a presentation of your research vision, uh, kind of in the form of your first R1 proposal. And I think the, the major thing that they're looking for is to show um, that you're coming in with fundable ideas. That that's the, you know, the metric of the interview. They want to see, is this person someone who can come in and get something done, create something, and has a vision? Um, and in terms of the format, it's typically an hour time slot. And if you prepare 20 to 30 minutes of material, that's typically funny, because you will get lots of questions. It will be very interactive. And a common question, can I use PowerPoint? No, uh, everybody talk talk. <laughs> Although I will say some some um, places said you could use PowerPoint, and I actually did on my first interview. It was a huge mistake. Um, it, it just doesn't lend itself. The, the type of presentation doesn't lend itself to PowerPoint. Um, working on the board allows you to kind of pace yourself, um, gives the audience to think and digest what you're saying, gives you time to, to really formulate our ideas, make them clear, and, and kind of develop a rapport with the audience and, and make it more interactive. If you just blow through your ideas, what, what have you really accomplished? You haven't um, fulfilled your objective, which is getting um, the faculty and in some cases most likely excited about what you're doing and what you're going to bring to the institution, right? So um, it's not just something you want to get through like that. So prepare to use the chalkboard or the, the dry erase board. So logistics, so again, the talk talk will be one aspect of your larger schedule. And on your schedule, it might say, you know, 15 minute break before your talk talk or setup. Don't believe that. Um, I would say that happened once out of eight times. So you don't want to um, have your talk talk in on having 20 minutes to draw some really sophisticated model on the board. And if that's not there, you're totally screwed and going to be um, in panic mode. So just assume that you're going to be starting with a blank board at the start of your presentation. Um, who will be there? At the minimum, the faculty from the department you're interviewing will be there. Um, oftentimes, you'll share scientific interests with other faculty across campus who will attend. Um, I'd say that 50 percent of them are also postdocs at my talk talks, where um, the department thought it was important to expose senior um, postdocs to what a talk talk is and how it kind of goes, which I think is valuable. Um, so expect that, and, and if that makes you uncomfortable with sharing your ideas, I don't know. You're kind of out of luck. I don't know that I would. <laughs> would say, don't do that. Um, but you can ask, so you know, in advance, who will be there, so you're kind of comfortable and, and ready for, for whatever. And um, expect to be interrupted. So again, this is, this is very different than um, most seminars that you give, where you kind of give your really polished spiel, and then at the end, you'll get some kind of questions. Um, this is, you will be probed and caught in, not you know, in an aggressive, mean way, hopefully, but in a way where people are really interested, they want to understand um, what you plan to do and whether you really um, thought about it in a depth that, that would be appropriate for you know, the idea that's going to start your business. <clears throat> so components of a good talk talk, again, this is from my own experience and the, the few talk talks that I've been to uh, since I started as a faculty member. But I think something that's really effective is you know, not just going into the, the weeds of your specific proposal, but you know, painting a bigger vision. What is, what is the idea that gets you excited that you really want to build your lab on? So that you can kind of give 
faculty a sense of, you know, here's a specific proposal, but here's the bigger picture, and clearly this is a really rich area that's exciting and fundable and, and, and is worth exploration and worth, um, you know, investing a you know, million dollars potentially into so getting this off the ground um, and, and kind of laying the stage. And also the larger vision, I think, is clearly the most accessible part of your, your talk talk. So you don't, you shouldn't have to have technical expertise in the field that you're in to get that and to appreciate that. Um, so, so and I think that's really important. Um, second, you want to get into your specific proposal, which is the, you know, the aims of your R01. And the first most important thing is, why do this? So you're now starting with a blank slate. In some sense, you could study whatever it is that you want. You can build your, your lab however you choose to. You're choosing to build it with this very specific proposal. Why? You know, what, why is it interesting? Why is it exciting? Why is it important? Um, and importantly, why, why will NH want to fund this? Um, you really should think about that and really um, communicate that enthusiasm that you have for what you want to do to the audience and really make them see it. Um, <laughs> about a third point, I think, is, is often uh, a pitfall from what I've seen from other people's talks is not presenting to the audience. Um, so you, it's unlikely that um, the department you're applying to will have an expert in your specific field, otherwise they, they wouldn't want to hire you, right? They already have that expertise there. So you don't want to have a jargon lady talk with you know, all the nuances of your system. You want to stay at a level that's accessible to most of the room, right? Um, but at the same time, kind of demonstrates your command of the knowledge, and obviously be prepared for maybe great questions should they come up, because um, you should know those answers. But um, you want to keep it a level that that kind of um, you will be followed, right? If that makes sense. We can we can talk more about that in the discussion. And lastly, I think the the critical point for a good talk talk is how you handle questions. Um, and again, this is quite different than. Uh, presenting work that you've done already, right? When you're when you're presenting research that you've done, you've thought about it deeply, you know the data really well, um, and it's highly unlikely that you'll get a question that's just totally out of the blue that you has never crossed your mind because you've just spent so much more time thinking about it than anybody else has. Now you're kind of flipping it, right? You're you're talking about an idea, you're talking about something that you want to do, and it's highly likely that you know someone else in the room will have a you know, thought or an idea or a contribution that you haven't thought of. Right, and, and um, handling that sort of question is very different, and it, it's really testing your ability to think on your feet, to, to take you know um, a criticism or a suggestion, kind of integrate it into your thought process, and come back with a response that you know this is a great idea. Um, you know, I know that that expertise is at this university. I would love to pursue that specific avenue uh, you know, if I were to be fortunate enough to come here. So, you know, something like that, but obviously in a more detailed. Um, way that's relevant to the question at hand, but um, it, it's important to, you know, to, to be ready for that. And, and I think the answer to that is good practice. We'll get to that in a second. So types of questions to expect. Uh, again, significance of your proposal. Why is this what you want to do? Um, your model system setup. So you're proposing mouse studies. Uh, someone can ask you, why aren't you doing this in human cells? Um, you know, being, you know why aren't you just doing a biomedical project and not take complete computation of why I'm not bothered with mice or human cells? Uh, or, I don't like mice or human, why aren't you using zebrafish models? Whatever. Like, those sorts of questions that you should just expect. And um, presumably, you have you know, a well thought out reason for why you're using the model you're using, whether you have like great preliminary data for it, or there's a ton of literature supporting this is a good model to study this question, whatever. Just kind of be prepared for that. Um, alternative approaches, so maybe you're uh, proposal is based on building some genetic construct or uh, making some deep or whatever. Um, but if that doesn't work, what are you going to do? Are you totally sunk and you're going to close the shop? Or do you kind of have you know, plan B, C, D, and E in case those things happen, which they inevitably do? And again, kind of um, demonstrate that you thought deeply about your plans and, and then kind of um, look ahead in the future about all things that could go right and could go wrong. And kind of other. So, um, there will be, I would say, wild card faculty in the audience. Uh, <laughs> and if they're included by your last, you know, you know all of them. Uh, so there'll be someone who just, for whatever reason, doesn't like the model that you're working with. And, you know, if you get into a long extended back and forth about it. And it's important to take that feedback, but um, address it and get back to what you're doing, right? It, it's really easy to go down a rabbit hole and just get, you know, into some tangential discussion 
that um, that well be might be enjoyable for that particular faculty is taking away your time and your opportunity to sell yourself, which is really what you want to do. That time is too valuable um, to allow it to all be sucked up, and you really need to, to control that and do it in a respectful way, which is important to do. Um, similarly, some faculty just want to take you somewhere that's totally different. Um, maybe they're not comfortable with what you're talking about, and they want to bring the discussion to something that's more interesting to them. Um, again, address that in a respectful way, but refocus, bring it back to what you want to talk about. Again, this is your time. So what can go wrong? So again, things that I've seen and maybe done in the past, um, too much, too little use of the word. So unless you're like a Steve Jobs type, type dynamic speaker and really clear and precise, it's unlikely that you can just give a speech and like communicate this without using the board at all. So I think that's a bad idea. Um, also a bad idea is using the board too much where you kind of um, are no longer interacting with the audience. Um, I think some of the most awkward talk talks are where someone's writing like sentences on the board or just like, really long games where there's just like silence in the room and nothing's happening. Um, you, you don't want to do that. You, you want to always keep it moving. Be really comfortable where you're going to write so you can talk and write at the same time. Like always keep the conversation going. And I think that creates a really nice environment and, and gets, keeps the audience engaged. Um, again, talking over the audience, you want to make sure that you're hitting the right level so it's accessible and exciting for everybody. Um, I think a common uh, kind of pitfall for, for most of your faculty, um, this is where you, is coming up with something that's overly, amb overly ambitious. So I've been to talk talks that are really interesting and exciting ideas, but it's like a career's worth of work. Um, and while that might be okay to some faculty, I think by and large, um, it shows sort of a lack of maturity that it, it's not clear you know, what can be done in five years, which is what, what you're supposed to be doing. And um, you know, from a practical perspective, if, if you kind of can't distill what it is that's done in five years, how you're going to write an R01 application, which will be done in five years, you're going to get those same sort of same sort of criticisms when you submit that grant. So I think it's important to you know, obviously develop your proposal, but then refine it and go over it with your mentors and, and people who aren't your mentors just to see you know, if this makes sense. With how, how would this fly with you? Um, again, going down a question rabbit hole, control the room. Again, do it in a respectful way. Always answer questions. Don't dismiss faculty. Uh, that, that, that's a bad idea. Not a good way to get the job. Um, but you know, this is again your time. So so make sure that. I mean, I've been to talk talk where they get through game one and that's it. And um, that's our lost opportunity, right? To, to sell your, your complete vision and could potentially hurt your chances of getting the job. And the last point, uh, losing your cool, I think this goes without saying, but again, there are some faculty that um, not necessarily through malicious intent can pose questions in an aggressive or critical way. Um, and it would be a mistake to you know, take a defensive posture and, get into some arguments, <laughs> like that's clearly not a good idea. And, and I think the, the advice that I would give is, um, you know, try to disregard the tone of the question and just hear the substance, right? And respond to it as we respond to any question um, based on the preliminary data, based on um, your all the literature, and based on your ideas, right? To, to, to take emotion out of it, and um, you will do well. Last tangential useful tips that were useful for me at least. I think I'd be comfortable presenting on the board. I think, uh, from my perspective, I've never given a talk talk, so this is very comfortable. I have terrible handwriting. I have not artistic. I can draw. It was just like, not a good situation. So I kind of sketched out what I want to do with my talk talk, and um, I just wrote it on the board over and over again without, uh, without vocalizing the presentation, just so I was comfortable writing what I wanted to write. And I could kind of just do it off the top of my head. And just having that made it so much easier to give the talk where I really didn't have to think about that. And I can really focus on what I was saying and focus on the audience and kind of read the audience and see what they're engaged and see that you know people are glazed over and be really focused on the board. Um, you know, that, that leaves yourself open to just you know, losing the audience and, and not seeing that things are going off the rail and correcting your course as needed. Uh, practice with diverse faculty that represent what you will like to see in your interview. Uh, so I gave two practice chalk talks. The first one, totally bomb. Um, and I just, I just missed the mark. I had never done it. I didn't know what the right level was. And I had way too much detail on the model, the computation of that. And it was just not good. So I took the feedback, refined it, and I think it became a lot more effective. Um, that was, um, I got really positive feedback 
on the on the interview and I think that's because of the practice stuff, because I don't it makes sense or amazing gift for doing talk talk it's like anything else, right? Practice and um, become comfortable with it and that will create confidence and allow you to do a good job. Um, and know your audience and mindful of where you are. So one example of this is if you're applying for a faculty position at an undergraduate teaching university, you probably don't want to make a proposal that Required like a notified commodity facility or a BSL 4 laboratory or supercomputers. Um, and you probably won't have the resources, so they're going to what are you doing here? Um, this isn't the job that you want. The kind of flip side of that is you could turn that into a positive. In a place like this, if you know the equities of the fact, you know the resources that are available, you, know, you can have your proposal, but mention that and every resources that are available here, and this would really open up exciting opportunities for me to pursue you know, direction access. And I think um, that strikes a nice chord that you've done the due diligence um, to really understand the place you're applying to and know the opportunities that it can create and it you know, creates a good rapport with the faculty, which is another um, thing that you're trying to achieve during the chalk talk. But lastly, a silly thing. Bring your own markers so you don't have uh, cycling through getting markers and uh, having it difficult for, for faculty to read. Um, that's my introductory spiel. I'm happy to, to take any questions. <coughs> Akila will be the interviewer, but some of you are kind of uncomfortably standing there. If you want to take this minute to go around, there's a little bit of space on the other side of the hallway. We have never had four hundred percent. So before we start with the questions, I'm um, just gonna ask Evan to kind of give us a quick detail of how he got here. Yeah, so I'll start I'll start early. So um, college, I was a computer science major. And I've been like crisis in my sophomore year, probably like half midlife, I guess, because <laughs> whatever. Uh, and kind of had visions of myself writing some small piece of like, cookbooks or something in some large conglomerate. And I was terrified, so I picked up a biology major to go to veterinary school. Uh, then worked in like, veterinary offices, didn't um, like certain aspects of that, and particular putting animals down and seeing people in really horrible states and, and so on, whatever. Um, abandoned that dream. Uh, <laughs> and kind of didn't know what I was going to do. And I was all, all like senior in college and had never considered a year, uh, career in research. And I had a biochemistry course, which was transformative for me. And it was the first biology course that I had taken that wasn't just multiple choice numbers It was really problem solving and what science has come to me to me. Um, and, and it's very exciting and uh, uh, it a lot of passion, but at the same time, my research experience was limited to animal behavior research focused on the response of parakeets when a hawk flies over there. <laughs> and so I wanted to specially position ideally to, to embark on, on the ultimate course that I ended up on. So I, I took a few years to be a research technician in an experimental lab. Um, and, and really enjoyed the research process, really enjoyed the literature and everything that you know goes with it. Um, but found myself not a reductionist at heart, I guess. I guess the entire two years I was in the lab, we studied one protein and they studied that protein in the tenured fire and had done really exciting things with that and I'll come up with you know, potential therapeutics and all of that. But I was more of a, a big picture a thinker or, or enjoyed that, that sort of thought. I went into bioinformatics and I got my PhD at, at Boston University in one of the first bioinformatics programs in the country. Um, I just uh, interviewed a, an undergraduate from my lab and she was really bad because she said that when I told her I got my teaching bioinformatics, she's like, wow, I didn't know they had that back then. <laughs> <laughs> Not with that, but anyway, <laughs> I, I enjoyed that program. It was one of the first, unfortunately. They're everywhere now. Um, really enjoyed my PhD, really enjoyed computational research. I did uh, a lot of my primitive genomics and, and studying like genome evolution, network evolution, um, very kind of basic research computation, which I enjoyed, but wanted ultimately to do something a little bit more translatable. And that led me to choose a postdoc at the National Institute of Health. Um, where I apply my expertise to my privilege genomics to study the health and infections and study evolution and body persistence in patients, uh, transmission of health care infections, and kind of that ultimately was, um, I think, the, the merging of my passion for not some very applied or study infections. There was 
have a lot of interest in collaboration from clinical microbiologists, from hospital epidemiologists, and translating our basic research findings into more effective you know, treatment of patients and prevention of infection. Um, but at the same time, it was also at, at its heart of study of evolution. We're studying evolution in action in patients uh, in the clinic in a way that's uh, meaningful to health. So this is what I really love. And I started my, my lab here um, after going on eight interviews and getting several offers, which I was quite fortunate and really happy to have received. Um, and now here, Papa Thank you. Um, so yeah, we'll start taking questions. So you mentioned uh, talking about the significance of the problem that you're going to be working on. We usually do that with like uh, statistics and uh, studies and like signing those. Do uh, you have to memorize them? How much notes can you take? Your games that you write, do you have to have them memorized? Or can you allow to look at the efficiency? Yeah. Yeah, I had like um, you know my notepad as a reference, which I ended up using because again I practiced so much that I kind of knew it. But in terms of stats, I, I use some, but I tried to do it in like a, a cover way, but a not boring way. So I just like wrote numbers on the board without saying what they were and kind of went through what they were to, for like shock value, I guess. <laughs> and then the other thing I did for significance was I started out drawing kind of like a bigger picture model, I guess, of, of um, how bacteria are transmitted in a hospital. Um, a really stupid stick figure cartoon, but was useful in terms of um, pointing out how different aspects of my research were probing different parts of that process. Um, but it was also something very like tangible, easy to understand, and again, something that was kind of above everything else I was writing to kind of point back to and kind of keep people you know, focused on where we were. And, and you know, that, might, that sort of like really simple model might not work for all research, but you could you know, come up with some sort of conceptualization that, again, is kind of people around everything that you're doing and brings people back to. And when you like, go off on those tangents that won't always happen you know, by interaction with the audience, um, you have something there to, to bring people back into that I think is, is nice and helpful. Yeah, so you like you kind of mentioned details and stuff like the R01 setup. Any kind of R01 can you like canceling their data, right? And half of what reviewers say is like, what about this? Like to your phone area data, like like how do you, in a talk talk format, obviously you don't have like a you can show with data. How do you address that? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, uh, I had very little permits from my data for what I was going to, what I presented on. Um, so there's that. But uh, I guess, it, I, I guess you, you can't get, you don't want to like draw figures and like sure. draw like graphs and things like that. Um, I think you can. You know, you'll bring up the preliminary data in response to specific questions and critiques, um, or you could, you know, preemptively bring it up and say, you know, I'm going to use this model. You know, I have great data showing that it works for engine stuff, whatever. Um, so, so I think both ways work, um, but you can do it in a way that's not um, down in the weeds with the data. You can do it at a conceptual level, um, but also at the same time, you know, part of the reason that. You know, you get a start package when you start your your lab is to generate your data, right? So, so there's some understanding that that everything is ready to go. You're not going to write the R01 on day one, so that's okay. So you mentioned um, knowing your audience and, and that in terms of the large school versus like a primarily undergraduate institution, you have a very different talk. Yeah. Did you actually interview at like a PUI or something like I, that? Yeah, yeah, I didn't. Uh, oh, okay, I was going to ask to talk about some of the differences. There. Yeah, um, this is kind of from, from talking to colleagues and, and, and postdocs at the time. Um, it was kind of advice that I got, but, but yeah, um, I, I can try to hook you up with people who have done that to, to get some more tangible advice in terms of how that talk talk might be different. Um, and I expect that they're also, I, 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 if you're also, for those who agree, you also have to give a curriculum and, and do a practice lecture or an actual class and it's more teaching intensive um, job opportunity. So it would require a very different preparation. Following that question about you know, uh, knowing the audience, you also mentioned that you know, uh, uh, at uh, faculty for review, you have to meet with lots of faculty members. The same thing, 
I want to know what's your approach on stopping these five from our past, a time of all their papers, like stock, how to stock them on the paper. So it kind of like changed over time. I guess the, the first interview I had, I read at least one paper uh, from some faculty I was with. And like have kind of some others, and you know, obviously some of them are like most of them are really way outside of my expertise. And it's not that I want to like understand, you know, I'm looking to go into immunology textbooks and read them, or that I was studying immunology for like 15 years. It wasn't like that, it was to more understand to try to glean what the big picture was. And uh, are there, there are other bases for uh, common interests? Um, and, and I think you'll find that most faculty, regardless of what they're studying, there are bases for common interests. Um, whether it be the sorts of technologies that are being applied, or interest in evolution, or um, interest in particular disease, or, or whatever, um, it, it's it's rare that you can't find something that you're both interested in. And I think identifying that in advance, one, I think it's just be more comfortable and confident going into those interviews, or at least did for me. Um, but also, it's, it's fruitful in terms of kind of you know, you're interviewing that as well, right? You tend to have multiple interviews, and you want to find um, a faculty that is interested in, in engaging and um, is enthusiastic about hearing about your ideas and and brainstorming about collaborations and all those sorts of things. That can get adds to that. Um, so that was my first interview, but I really did that diligence and um, it just became a lot. So I didn't necessarily go to that level you know, for every interview, but, but I at least would know. Um, what their major papers were and have gone into the website. And one sort of um, tip that someone gave me that I found to be really useful is I created um, like an, an ever new document for each interview that had um, like a picture of the faculty from their website and just a few bullet points to remind me who they were. And, and when you're going from person to person to person, it just, you can forget. <laughs> and really, and it, it's, it's helpful to kind of know where, what you're going into and kind of get yourself reoriented. And typically, you'll have you know, five minutes walking between meetings, but you can kind of glance at it real quick and say, okay, this is where I'm going at. Um, do you have conditions on like how to bring back the talk to you, like you mentioned, like, going down a rabbit hole? And kind of related question about the why well, the hypothesis is wrong, and they say you have plan B, and then they go, well, that won't work either. So you have two plans, and they say both are going to fail. How do you like come back to your focus? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, they're not going to be able to say this won't work. If someone says something like, yeah, I just tried this, that doesn't work. Right? <laughs> <laughs> like, it's going to be, you know, they think, like, what if it doesn't work? So it's really about um, knowing, having the evidence to support your, your argument that it does work, right? And like, pointing to literature, pointing to your preliminary data, and saying, this works because it's YZ, and if it doesn't, a lot of labs have used this approach and been successful and shown you know, these really cool results, whatever. Um, so it's, it's not, it won't be as black and white as that and impossible to come back from. It's really uh, more than them being critical of you know, the particular aspect of your approach or hypothesis. They want to see that you can defend it, right? Um, so, so just be prepared to do that. Orange. Um, one question I had is regarding handouts. Could you give any sort of handout to the audience members, either, I don't know, with your timeline of your proposal, your aims, um, where you would speak to get funding? Yeah, I didn't. Uh, I think I've been to two that have, and at least for those two, they weren't super useful because it was just like an aims page. And you know, if you're getting, getting it as the presentation starting, then uh, you're not going to be able to read it. And with all of these, these um, faculty positions, one of the documents that you have to provide is, is a more detailed research plan that's you know, two or three pages. So they'll already have something like that that presumably will be pretty similar to what you're presenting in your talk talk. And they have access to that if they want to read it. Yeah, so. Every department has like some faculty that can be particularly like let's say antagonistic. <laughs> uh, have you like in the be persistent, have you seen any cases or have examples or just like maybe specifics of where a person is trying to pivot 
and like kind of couldn't and just was able to get out of it. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, I think it's um, I think the, the bigger danger is not trying to pivot and just kind of um, keeping it going. Um, I, I don't think that if you, if you try to go back to your talk and, and do it in a reasonable way and kind of reasonable answer the question, um, you should be able to do that. Um, and, yeah, I, I wouldn't be too worried about that. Um, you don't want to say, I'm not going to answer that question. Like that's not reasonable. Next I'm, question. I'm, 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 yeah, yeah, like that's not reasonable either. There's there's a balance. Yeah. I'm kind of interested in your uh, talking about um, the balance of writing too much versus not writing enough, and like what fraction are you drawing something, what fraction are you writing yeah. something? What do you write out for? So I wrote um, for each game. I would try to come up with like between five and ten words, eight max. That just kind of summarized pointing where, and we can say more than that, but you have just something really short just so people can remember and refer back to. Um, and then for the actual content of the aims, I tried to do everything conceptually. Um, so I think the, the first aim was some sort of making a genetic construct and applying it in some way. So I just kind of drew the construct in, not in detail with like all the elements of it, but just here's how it would work, and this is the sorts of. Environments you want to use the construct, and this is what we want to learn. All pictures. The second aim was computational and modeling. Um, and I think a disaster with going to a microbiology like, analogy department and writing your equation on the board. That's a good part of it. That's probably not good job. So I drew conceptually what the model is and, and kind of wrote bullet points of what are the assumptions that's making and maybe like one equation that was really easy to understand, which hopefully made everyone feel good that it was like accessible. Um, and then thirty was animal models and drawing and that's and what we're gonna do with it. Yeah, like I think the less text the better. Yeah. So what do you do if you completely get stumped with a question that you're not sure how to answer and yeah. you're on the spot? What do you do in that case? I think the worst thing you could do is pretend you know the answer. <laughs> and that goes for like any seminar you give. Like it's okay not to know things. Like, no one knows everything and, and you could acknowledge that. Um, and can do the best you can with what you know. Um, and again, try to, to turn into a positive and say, you know, I know there's that expertise here, and um, that's something I'm interested in learning more about or incorporating my research or whatever. Or just say, you know, I'm not familiar with that. Uh, I'll develop more into it, whatever. Like, that's totally fine. Um, so, did you ask your faculty host for any feedback on what you found most interesting about your and gear your chalk talk towards that, or did you just have a standard one for everyone? Uh, pretty standard. Uh, you could ask questions. You, know, you can kind of get an idea for what the department strength and decision and interest are based on people in the faculty. Um, you can ask who will be there, which could be useful, and you know, some people's research will lend itself to applying to very different departments. Um, so I did have interviews that were in bioinformatics departments, and I, I did include more computational jargon and, and things like that in the discussions to, to make it evident that I had that, that knowledge and understanding, or if I kind of talked about things in a too conceptual manner, I, I was afraid it would come off as uh, that I didn't have a depth of knowledge. So I think that might be what I meant in like meeting your audience. And, and the structure of what I wanted to do was the same, it was how I was talking about it and what I was emphasizing was different. Yeah, I mean, I think um, it differs in the sense that you were given grants, you're probably presenting, so you're probably presenting like the P99 R00, you're probably presenting R00 in the R01. Okay, um, so you present on what you have been given money for, and as well as the future. It, it should still be the R01 yeah. that that's designed to go into, but you might start with the point of data from that, or that's kind of an idea, presumably, so you'd probably start with that. Um, I wouldn't. So I don't 
definitely think that's true that you need a fact, you need like a K to get a faculty position. Um, yeah, it does. It does. I think, I don't I think people, uh, again, but the reason, you know, one of the, the major objectives of the talk talk and interview in general is to assess whether this person is doing quantum research and it makes it easier for them to. And I said they're doing quantum research, so they're doing quantum research, mm -hmm. but. Um, you know, I don't know, but, but again, I, I had I had another K. Um, no one had cared or asked me about it. Uh, yeah, so I, so I wouldn't be like, intimidated if you don't have to keep getting a K that this can't work out. Do you suggest sticking to like one idea or like maybe let's say three ideas, pick one or like two or three? <laughs> Yeah, so if you're talking like ideas like grants, I don't think yeah. you could do justice to three grants in that amount of time. Uh, I had, so like, I guess I, I wanted to emphasize um, kind of that I would be continuing some of the work that I would be doing in my postdoc, but that um, life's nature is very collaborative, and it wouldn't really make sense for me, for me to have uh, written a proposal on something that I don't know who I'll be working with yet. So I kind of just mentioned my general interest in that area and that I would want to establish collaboration and once I engage my faculty position, but kind of presented the idea of really deep that was like maybe five to 10 minutes. And then I kind of said, well, this is one aspect of my lab, but I want to tell you something that's going to live totally in my lab and it'll be collaborative. And that's what my, my R01 proposal was. Um, so I, I think it's okay to mention other interests and other areas that you're in going into, but not in the depth of a whole proposal. Sort of along those lines, if there's something that you don't necessarily have a technical expertise in that support from your collaborator on, how much do you get into that? Track? I guess. I guess it depends. Like, so long, uh, you have to make clear that like, your collaborator, not your former PI's collaborator, and I guess that goes into a question of. Which wasn't super relevant for me, but can be relevant of making sure you distinguish yourself from your previous mentor, which I think is an issue that can come up, um, and a question that you'll be point up, point point asked. I think very commonly in interviews, um, <laughs> this kind of place in where your mentor, why should we fund you? They're gonna like, destroy you. Like it's, you don't want to keep your mentor obviously because they're they're already established and yeah. funny. It's just not a good, good way to start. Um, so I think that that would be one issue with that. Uh, but I think saying that you know, you're going to do things in collaboration, to me, is not a problem. And I think it's becoming more acceptable as quote unquote team science is more accepted and understood as a powerful way to, to do science. Does it help to know the evidence that you have already had the connection with the instant collaborator? Like, you probably do nothing, any work, having like a letter from somebody that um, doesn't say, yeah. I think you people will take your word for it. Um, so what? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 what if you didn't have like, multiple um, R1 ideas or more than one? Or do you focus on one or actually try to present more than one, which has the risk of, you know, they will say, you know, they will say, you know, Yeah, I would, I would focus on one. Um, Again, you can lead to other ideas and other directions or extensions of, of the work um, that could form complementary grants, but there's won't be time to go into any meaningful depth and um, likely just won't get people to get through it. So it kind of would be a fruitless effort. So better to prepare for one um, really strong presentation, one really focused grant. Um. Do you think it's a good idea to go preemptively talk about how you're different from your post of advisor or Yeah, I mean, I think it can't hurt um, to kind of you know, say, this is where I've been, this is what I've been doing in my previous mentor's lab, this is where I want to go. Uh, I think that's fine. And I think, again, I think you'll be asked that quite commonly if it's not totally obvious. So I have a question. Yeah. Um, so you talked about practicing. Your talk. Um, how do you go about um, recruiting 
the people that you know will practice like you want a faculty member who you see now you know with a new faculty some post how did you go about you know putting these people to listen to you? Um, I just a cold contact with them or there's a faculty that I had come across through various interactions during my post doc. Um, and if you're, if you're not comfortable doing that, I think most faculty will, will gladly participate and help. Um, you can talk to your direct mentor and say, who do you think would be good to have in attendance? And um, can we coordinate and reach out to them? Either is fine. But I don't think any cool faculty are pretty generous of their time and um, are looking to help change the institution that employers can see. And, and this is an important part of training. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I have a terrible aunt though. You can't draw a picture of my life. Yeah. Uh, you <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> just to keep the picture in text and form. Like my, again, my handwriting is terrible. Um, my, my dad's an English teacher, uh, so he was very upset when I would get all these unacceptable attendance shipment in elementary school. He would hold a pencil or pen like, like a knife. Yeah. Uh, so it just, it's just not good. That, that's part of the reason I think I went into computer science that I could never have to write anything. Uh, but it wasn't like a huge obstacle. Draw a simple, understandable picture and practice it, right? And I think you can, you can get by it and not have it be a uh, major impediment. Um, so you know, you said typically it takes 20 to 30 minutes. Um, what happens if you are going a lot of time and you know, that stuff? And how do you handle that? Like you're just kind of random and you're close, like, oh, you know, stuff. And well, I mean, once the time's over, it's over. So there's like, you have a, a pretty packed schedule. So once the hour's over, you have to end up eating. Um, so that's why it's important to, to really focus the discussion and make sure you say what you want to say. And don't get kind of stuck in things. Aren't really adding to the second thing you're saying. Um, so I know this is will be covered on the back up, but do you have any say to how these are evaluated? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, kind of, kind of being on the other side of it, I think seeing how the particular research fits into the bigger picture of what the company does, whether it's a good fit, um, is, it, is it a potential area of need, um, whether that person uh, presents or something that seems fundable and coherent, whether it's whether they're overly ambitious, whether they're not ambitious enough, whether it's too similar to the prior metrics work, or what are concerns that could come up. Um, and also, just, I think, Ability to communicate effectively. Um, when you see their, their research statement that I submitted as part of the package, that's been you know, polished and doing really mentors with team, this is really your ability to get people excited about your science, which is pretty really very predictive of your ability to get funding. That, that, that's the art of writing the grants is having people see the picture and why it's important and that convincing them that you are the person to do it and you can do it and all of that kind of what if your top top team evaluated on with a verbal draft proposal. Um, so uh, I, I know you've kind of... Wait, I've kind of thought of the previous question about 30 minutes long. What if you don't have to make questions and then you're done by 25 points for the whole world? Yeah. Yeah. People have an extra 20 minutes. I don't think that happened to me. Uh, in the, like people with last questions, like I, I wouldn't be too worried about that. Uh, but if it ended early, I don't think that's like a catastrophe either. Uh, I have a question. I have a question. Uh, maybe you mentioned a little bit with that. So you have background on the wet lab and uh, dry lab. Uh, what's the kind of uh, percentage balance are uh, uh, you, uh, and how does this uh, uh, influence your decision to which of department are you going to apply for? I mean, uh, how do you uh, position yourself with the job market uh, at the peer? Uh, yeah, so in terms of what to apply for, I would say apply broadly. Um, for me, I think mean, the, the places I got interviews in in retrospect, kind of made sense because I, I had a very specific need in terms of what I needed to, to do the research I wanted to do. Um, but I've heard from other people that uh, you know they did not expect to end up where they ended up based on the description of the ad. Uh, 
And I think if the court is stretching it a little bit, because these are really competitive positions and you want to maximize your chances of, of getting a, a job, right? It's definitely not the sort of thing where you apply to like two places and expect to, to end up in one though. So you mostly mentioned about this. Is there something about teaching that one should prepare for the Not for the talk talk. I think maybe yeah. the places I applied to required a teaching statement. Um, but these were you know, research track um, positions, primarily medical school, so it was sort of secondary. I, I would be surprised if any, any people read it. Put in the hours up front 
you're, you're wearing a lot of different hats and learning a lot of new things uh, for training and management and money and things that you've never had to think about and that are all very foreign and some of them very boring that you have to care about nonetheless. So you mentioned, right, that you have a percent of what we would like to do, right? So our research as common is based on our lab line of research. So how much is expected, you know, when you propose to defer from what you published previously or your mentor research? Yeah, I mean, it's not like it's going to be you know, totally out of left field. Like I've done, you know, I've chosen all this and now I'm going to uh, work with mice. Like it's not going to be that big, right? It's going to, you know, you know, a, a typical situation is I learned this skill or expertise in my PhD, I learned this skill or expertise or system in my postdoc, and now I'm going to put that together and do really amazing things that neither of my past mentors are interested in or have done. I mean, that's probably most typical. Um, or it's possible that you did your PhD and you hated it. You didn't know enough to know that you hated what you did, and you totally disagreed from your postdoc and you want to build off that. Um, so regardless, it, it clearly has to be distinguished from what your prior methods are doing. Um, and you keep that, I, I think as a postdoc, I did this in my postdoctoral mentor, it's important to have those conversations uh, throughout your training about, you know, I'm going to work on this project next, can I take that with me, or is this living on that, uh, or would you be comfortable with that, or come to those agreements if, if the plan is for you to start your own lab. So, following with that, so if you can propose something new, you know, how much the linear data, you know, within that topic is a good that you have, or you bring it in? Yeah, I think it varies. I think it's good to have some full rate data. Um, and that's kind of what the end of your postdoc is oftentimes spent doing, generating that super data. Uh, again, I had very little. I guess they, they, I think more than the data, it's convincing them that you can do it, whether it's with data or with your past expertise or, or, or just the, the nature of the work that you can do it. Um, one last question. So going back to starting your research program and getting researchers in your lab, is there much interest in showing that you have the ability to lead people and mentor people? Does, does that come up? Or? Um, I think it, I mean, as part of your application and CV, you'll you know, have higher mentor experience. I think that, one, it's important from the interview side, but it's also important for your, for your training and to get that experience, you know, that's what you'll be doing and knowing how to to work with people with different levels and different expertise um, and impart important knowledge and, and teach them to be good scientists is critical to what we'll be doing. I don't know how much that comes across in the interview process itself, other than your ability to effectively communicate, which I think is a big part of being a good trainer. Mm -hmm. Last question. So you mentioned that you have a and you can ask me to for this one. No, I mean, I hope this is really helpful. And I'd be happy to talk offline if you have other questions about this or any part of the interview process or any part about what it's like to start a lab. Uh, I'd be happy to share what I know. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh